Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. Today we're going to look at the Moon, where it came from, what it's made of and how we've explored it, particularly in the Apollo missions. The Earth is the only rocky inner planet with a Moon, except for a couple of tiny rocks that Mars probably stole from the asteroid belt. The Moon is, proportionally, the biggest Moon in our solar system compared with its host planet. It has helped to stabilise the Earth, giving us much more predictable seasons, tides and orbit than we'd otherwise have. This stability is crucial for life, especially complex life like ourselves. It also gives us wonderful solar eclipses and an enticing target for exploration, helping us to advance science in the 20th century. But where did it come from? The leading explanation is the giant impact hypothesis. Early in Earth's history, another planet struck the Earth. This planet, which was about the size of Mars, is called Theia, the mother of the moon in Greek mythology. Theia formed in a Lagrange point, in Earth's orbit but 60 degrees ahead or behind. Objects at Lagrange points can stay there for a while, but the orbit isn't stable, and Earth's gravity gradually pulled Theia out of its orbit, until the two planets collided. This huge impact melted or vaporised a lot of the Earth, and all of Theia. An enormous amount of debris was thrown into orbit around Earth. For a while, Earth would have had rings like Saturn, but this coalesced into the Moon. The Moon was much closer then, and would have looked spectacular from Earth, an enormous body, still red-hot and flowing with lava. Over time it has cooled and receded from us. It's currently moving away from Earth about 4 centimetres per year. The giant impact hypothesis was quite controversial at first, but since the Apollo missions brought back rocks from the Moon, we've uncovered more evidence. The ratio of oxygen isotopes, O16, O17 and O18, are different on different planets, but they're the same on Earth and the Moon. The Moon's surface is largely volcanic igneous rocks. This shows that the Moon was once molten. The tremendous energy required to melt it could only have come from a giant impact. And there's the iron core, Earth's iron core is particularly big, but the Moon's iron core is particularly small. When Theia was vaporised, its heavy iron core fell to Earth, making its way through the Earth's mantle, leaving the Earth with more iron in the core, and the Moon with less. This is the most common explanation for the Moon's origin, but there are a few things we haven't explained yet, so there are a few alternative ideas. The main ones are capture theory, where the Moon formed elsewhere by itself, drifted too close to Earth, and was captured by Earth's gravity. Co-accretion theory, where the Earth and Moon formed together, at the same place and time. And fission theory, where the Earth was spinning so fast that a part of it broke off and was thrown into space. The hole left behind is now called the Pacific Ocean. Internally, the Moon is quite similar to Earth and the other rocky planets, but with several important differences. The Moon has a core of mostly iron, with some other elements, including nickel. But it's a very small core, about 20% of the Moon's radius, whereas the Earth's core is about 50% of the Earth's radius. As we just saw, this is probably because the Earth got most of the iron in the collision with Theia. Like Earth, the inner core is solid, while the outer core is liquid. Most of the Moon is the mantle. This used to be molten, but now is mostly cold and solid. At the surface is the crust, this is about 50 kilometres thick on average, but ranges from 30 kilometres to 160 kilometres. And it's possible that in some regions there is no crust and the mantle is exposed. This diagram is to scale. The Moon is not symmetrical though. The core is actually offset from the centre by about 4 kilometres towards Earth. Also, the near side's crust is thinner than the far side. The reason for both of these is the fact that the mantle used to be hotter and liquid. Iron is denser than the surrounding mantle. You might have done an experiment where you drop a steel ball into treacle. It will fall, slowly, down to the earth. A gram of steel is pulled down just as strongly as a gram of treacle, but steel is denser, so it falls through the treacle towards the centre of the earth. This continued, very slowly, until the core reached a stable position and eventually the mantle around it froze solid. The mantle was also pulled further than the crust, with a similar effect. By the way, the offset shown in this diagram is exaggerated. 
and definitely not to scale. The asymmetry between the near and far sides caused them to look different on the surface, which I discuss more in my video on the lunar features. The thinner near side crust is more vulnerable to being smashed open by comets and asteroids, spilling magma across the surface to create maria. Craters are more common on the far side because many near side craters were covered underneath the maria. This doesn't happen much anymore. The mantle is cold and solid, and the big asteroids have mostly already done their damage. Exploring the moon is hard because gravity keeps us down here on Earth. To get into orbit, or further, to the moon, we need to supply a lot of energy, very quickly, and we can only do that with rockets. You can see the main equation in rocket science at the top of the screen. You won't use it in the GCSE, but it doesn't look that hard. The difficulty comes when you try to use it to design a real rocket. The course specification says that spacecraft need to reach the Earth's escape velocity, which means the speed at which an object would travel away from Earth forever escaping its gravitational influence. This isn't quite true, but it's close enough. Escape velocity from Earth is 11 kilometers per second, which corresponds to 120 megajoules of kinetic energy for every kilogram of spacecraft. The common rocket fuel RP-1, which is essentially kerosene, provides 40 megajoules per kilogram. So to lift one kilogram of spacecraft, we need three kilograms of rocket fuel. However, we're taking that fuel with us too, plus the fuel tank, rocket engine, guidance systems, life support and so on. And we're going to lose some kinetic energy to atmospheric drag. At first, this looks impossible, but our rocket's mass goes down over time as we burn fuel. Rockets also use staging, where we have several fuel tanks and we ditch them as they empty. There are several other clever scientific and engineering tricks that turn rocket science from impossible to just really, really hard. The Apollo missions, which we'll get to soon, used the Saturn V rocket. It carried 140 tonnes into orbit, but fully fuelled, its mass was nearly 3,000 tonnes. This is a rocket to payload mass ratio of 20 times. This was used in the 1960s, but we're still using similar numbers, because we haven't really found a better fuel. All this fuel means that a rocket is essentially a giant bomb. The explosion is tightly controlled, but things do go wrong sometimes, and entire rockets have exploded, sometimes with crew inside, like the 1986 Challenger disaster. Here is a diagram of Saturn V on the launch pad. Three minutes after launch, when it had ditched the first rocket stage, it looked like this. After ten minutes, this was left and three hours later, this much headed to the moon. This part left the moon's orbit, and this splashed down in the Earth's ocean, with barely space for three astronauts and some souvenirs. For GCSE astronomy, you are expected to understand the main features of the Apollo program to land astronauts on the moon. I could make hours of videos about the Apollo missions, and you could read thousands of books, but I'll keep it simple. I've made a separate optional video where I discuss the history behind the Apollo missions, go through each mission in a bit more detail, and explain the scientific experiments. Here, I'll just give you the basic summary that you need for the GCSE. Apollo was a political and scientific program to land Americans on the moon. Apollo 11 was the first moon landing in 1969, and Apollo 17 was the last in 1972. Apollos 11 through 17 were all successful, except Apollo 13, where an explosion forced the astronauts to abort and return to Earth. The Apollo astronauts brought lunar rocks back to Earth for analysis, and left scientific experiments to study things including moonquakes, the moon's atmosphere and magnetic field, and solar radiation. Retro reflectors were left on the moon, allowing us to determine the precise distance to the moon. To get to the moon, we needed enormous rockets, which provided the huge amount of energy needed to escape Earth's gravitational influence. And finally, something that definitely won't be on your exam. On the 11th of April 2019, an Israeli moon lander, Bereshit, crash-landed on the moon. 
it carried a digital library, but more interestingly, some tardigrades. Tardigrades are small creatures which can survive the vacuum of space, and it's likely that they're still alive on the moon's surface in suspended animation, waiting for a little drop of water to wake them up. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and have an excellent day.